When is the last time you listened to a podcast about web development, web design, and small business and didn't fall asleep? Yes, we cover web development, web design, and small business, but like actual human beings with personalities. If you're a beginner, we're not going to talk over your head. It's more like asking your buddy for help. We have guests, we have fun, and let me tell you, these two can get off on a tangent. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to HTML All The Things Podcast. This is Matt Lawrence and Mike Curran. That's right, everybody. We are back in this episode 118, What You Need to Know About Package Managers, which is supposed to be about Webpack. Mike, I'm calling you out on this one. You told me last night it was going to be a Webpack episode. I was all excited, and then you, you, you shot me in the foot. But anyway, I'm Matt. That's Mike, and this week we'll be discussing... Apparently, we're, here we go, Mike. This is, your epi- this is your intro, bud. This week we'll be discussing <laughs> switching careers to web development. Didn't didn't fill in all the blanks. This week we'll be discussing not Webpack. I'll say that. And then in the web news, standardizing our websites. Now, if this sounds inter- interesting to you and you want to support the show, you can go check us out on that Patreon. Leave a review or rating on your podcast app. Join us in our Discord server or share this with your friends. And now it's time for our weekly pain points. So, Mike, please, sir, take it away. All right. And, yeah, this was supposed to be a well Webpack, but then I kind of delved into package managers because I thought, you know, to, to understand Webpack, you kind of understand, need to understand package managers, and that turned out to be a whole other topic. So we will have a Webpack episode, just for everyone to know. Um, but first, let me just introduce package managers, uh, kind of building block for the Webpack discussion. So with that being said, weekly pain point was the dentist. Uh, went to the dentist, sucks. That was my pain point. Moving on, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> well, mine's like just what just what basically is happening a lot these these days. Just too much going on. I've been fielding. I've been on phone calls all literally all day. Uh, you know, important phone calls, but you know, phone calls nonetheless. And a bunch of stuff is just just flying all over the place. We got proposals to do. People calling. Uh, people need help. Support calls. Marketing calls. Sales calls. It's uh, it's you know. It's a busy time, apparently, so it's going to be a little bit crazy. The end of 2020 is poising to be, or posing to be very, very crazy, uh, and it uh, looks like it might be crazy into the new year as well, depending on how these projects go, and if we, some of them are going to be completable, which is nice. Complete them, move on, but we'll see uh, if we actually move on or if something else fills their place, which they pro- which it probably will, but uh, I'll pass it off to you, Mike, to uh, introduce us to uh, Not Webpack. <laughs> All right, uh, so let me introduce... Segment number one, which is just the introduction to what a package manager actually is. So first to discuss a package manager, we have to kind of define a package a little bit. So a package would be a self-contained code that does a specific function, usually something uh, that can take an input and give you an output or something that when called upon will give you a certain a certain um, result. And sometimes these can be very expensive, like a framework can be a package technically, or sometimes it could be something really small that like essentially adds two numbers and gives you back a number in a certain format or something like that. So they can range from size, but essentially a package is something that's self-contained. That's the main part. So a package manager in turn is a system that helps you maintain the dependencies between the packages and then your project. So not only are there dependencies that the packages rely on, because each package could also have packages that it relies on. And we've talked about this before, dependency hell, uh, like just multiple different defend- dependency stacks. There's ma- many different ways that dependencies work. But essentially what a package manager allows you to do is manage all that so that you don't have to go in there and be like, okay, this package relies on you know seven different dependencies. Let's manually install those dependencies. Oh, wait, in seven dependencies, there's like seven, all these packages have like 15 dependencies. So without a package manager, you would have to literally manually install every single package and their dependencies and then somehow correlate them so that they all work together. So possible, but on the other hand, kind of impossible if you have a a fairly complex project. Um, So today we're going to look at two package managers. I'm not sure if there's any other ones. There's probably are, but the main ones are NPM and Yarn. Actually, the main one that I'll be looking at is NPM, but I just want to give kind of a little um, information about Yarn just for everyone to know. I haven't used it too much. I've used it a couple times, but from what I understand, Yarn is kind of built upon NPM, but what it does is it allows you to version control your packages a little bit better. So it allows, allows you to have a consistent version across essentially uh, 
your your pro your project. So if you were to give your project to someone else, they would be downloading the exact same version of packages as you have on your machine. While currently it, with npm, you can do that absolutely, but you have to kind of go in and manually set all that up for for all the packages. And I'll get into it a little bit later, but. Um, with Yarn, it kind of handles that for you so you have better consistency. So if your team is using, if, we're, if you're all using the same project and someone has an issue because they downloaded the wrong package version, that's kind of what Yarn helps to stabilize. And because of that, it, it kind of is known to provide more stability in large projects. Um, so it's something that I'll be looking into in the future, but it's not necessar necessary to actually accomplish anything. And I think it's more important to talk about NPM because that's kind of what yarn was based on in the first place so npm stands for node package manager it is a way to access and maintain all the packages that are publicly available for node.js these are all packages that are written in javascript so there's just the javascript package manager essentially and the packages can help you accelerate development of your code because what they do is they kind of obfuscate or remove the need for complex features to be written out manually um, there, so it allows you kind of to focus on your apps logic and then use other packages to fill in the gaps and not have to build out every little thing. And some examples of that would be like uh, request. It's a simplified HTTP request client. So when you're doing HTTP requests, uh, instead of having to write out the whole XML.HTTP request stuff and all the packages and headers that go with it, the request library or package can help you just quickly, you know, type out a request put it in the correct format that it gives you in the documentation, send it out, receive what, what you need, do all the async, uh, async promise stuff. It helps you kind of manage that rather than you having to write it yourself. Stuff like moment.js, although it's discontinued, it was a really big package at some point that helped you parse, validate, manipulate, and display dates. So you don't have to worry about figuring out what time zone you're in and you know how to manipulate the date to show it in a certain format. You just kind of give moment.js, you, you, you put moment.js to your project and use its documentation on how to output the proper dates that you want to see. Vue.js is also a package. It's a much bigger package that relies on other packages, but it is still a package. And uh, it's obviously a really popular one, and it's really easy to set up with a package manager, almost impossible to set up with that one. Uh, stuff like Lodash, it's an array manipulation value and, and a value testing library. So again, it helps you kind of iterate over an array uh, efficiently, stuff like that. Then there's Passport, which is a backend library for authentication. So these are just examples of kind of popular NPM packages, uh, just for your own knowledge. But um, know that there's many, many more, uh, all of di varying different sizes, varying different functionalities. But each one, again, is kind of publicly available in the package manager context. So when generating a project, the first thing that gets created is a package.json file. And that's exactly what I kind of want to get into in segment number two. So I have a couple questions. So it's like, it sounds like there's a, you know, just from that list even alone, uh, as well as the the description that you gave, it sort of sounds like packages are, like there's, there's a lot of packages for a lot of different things. And obviously like they have different versions and that type of thing. So my question, I guess, comes from longevity, I suppose. So, you know, it sounds like you could reach for, just looking into the list here, you could reach for, you know, Passport, for example, for your authentication library. So let's say you build out like a full program, whatever it is, uh, build web app with this, you know, this authentication library. How how much longevity are, we, are you expecting from this? So I guess I come from like a perspective of like maintaining a site. So obviously when you sort of compile whatever app you're doing, you come it comes together and let's say you're using this passport thing for it's for users to log in. Are we talking that like that site should, you know, effectively run forever as long as the host is, you know, the same, like the service itself running? Do you need to be updating this package? If the package itself becomes unsupported, is it easy to bring in another package? You know, like how much I suppose it's like how how much longevity are you getting? Out of the convenience, it seems, of having packages at your disposal. Okay, so that's a, that's actually a really good question. Um, but for for example, let's take Passport.js uh, that that package. It's a good example because it'll work for a long time. Like so, you you won't have to update it. But stuff like uh, let's say Apple login comes around, right? The way mm -hmm. the way to log in with Apple. That's a fairly new thing. Passport.js in turn has to build out functionality to be able to support it from their APIs. Okay. Right. So if you want to add Apple login to your site, 
then you would have to then update the Passport plugin. Right. Right. So that's the kind of stuff that you would have to do. Sometimes it's possible that Google can update their way of authenticating. Like they, like they're, they, you know, de- depreciate, deprecate a certain way of authenticating and put a new one in and then Passport has to go in there and adapt. I don't know if that's ever happened, to be honest. Um, it might, it might happen. It might not. That's something that could force you to, to update, to update. There could be security issues. That could be something that forced you to update. But in turn, like for the most part, very rarely are you forced to go into your project years down the line and update a package unless there's some sort of functionality that you're missing that's come up recently. Right. So absolutely can happen, but it's not something that you should be worried about on a consistent basis. It's not this. It's not the same security risk, I would say, and people can correct me if I'm wrong, um, as uh, WordPress packages or WordPress plugins. They're not as re- easily accessible from within your app as the vulnerabilities inside of WordPress plugins would be. Absolutely, still possible to manipulate to, to exploit a package, but not as easy. If that makes sense. So let me ask you this then. So let like let's say for example you're running some sort of like you're a web developer, okay? So then you're but you're doing client work specifically. So a client calls you up, they want something done, some sort of web app that requires authentication. You land on Passport JS. You uh, you know you have the latest version, so you have you know the Google login I think you mentioned, and then as well as the Apple ID of course, and then you have those two now. So that's how the people log in. The user is happy with it, and that's it. So what I guess what I'm asking is is it's like. Okay, you you make this web app for them. You with this authentication, you give it to them, and then you walk away. And this is actually a conversation that you and I have had a conversation about quite a bit. Where we have this weird problem where it's sort of like, well, like, are we on call twenty four seven to support this? What's the implication of that? You know, um, is this thing going to have to be maintained repeatedly? If Apple changes how they authenticate, is Password JS going to have to work or change? Is it going to break in place, and then they're completely screwed? You know, like what are like those type of questions, because as, as and the web news will come to this, but or we'll talk, we'll touch on this is we have a problem right now where we're starting to get to the point where we have a whole bunch of different code bases, which I'm not going to dive into until the web news, but we also have a bunch of different clients and we have this problem where the person's first, first call is us. So like, you know, we build out something like even if it's something as simple as like, I'm just making this up completely, but uh, an artist comes to us, they're a photographer, they want us to make a photo gallery site for them. So we do that. All of a sudden the light box stops working. You know, what's the implication of having all of these moving parts and all these packages when it comes to longevity in terms of maintenance from the web developer's perspective? So when you make a, a program based on a bunch of packages like this. The first thing I always think is like, man, I hope, I hope all this stuff work. Like it's, it's, it's the same concern as WordPress. I hope it, I hope all this stuff continues to work because if it doesn't, or there's a compatibility problem, like we got a serious problem. So are all websites, you know, within reason, of course, like if PHP in the future disappears, of course, like then there it goes, you know, of course things are eventually going to go away. You don't see model T's driving around that much anymore, but in the same breath, it's sort of a question of if you make a website for somebody and you give it to them and that's it, are you responsible? Like, is that thing, I guess what I'm asking ultimately is, is that thing a ticking time bomb and does it need consistent maintenance or does it not? I, okay. So let me, let me answer it in a couple of different ways. I, I don't think it is a typical ticking time bomb over anything that you would create with just vanilla JavaScript. But I want to say that, yes, creating something just straight up vanilla, no packages, nothing is most likely going to be more stable than using a bunch of packages because of the dependencies. But on the other hand, if you think about it, um, let's say, for example, this Apple ID thing that happens, right? So they, some, someone comes out like they, Apple came out with their Apple sign in um, and they gave you all the information you needed to implement it. What you would have to do, like if your customer would reach out to you or if you want to just be proactive, is you would have to go in, read their documentation and figure out a way to implement it in your app manually. Okay. There's not much of a difference. Actually, it's a lot easier to use a third-party package that already handles all of that information for you and just releases a simple like function for you to use that logs into Apple 
similarly how they do with all the other things. So all you would have to do with a, if you're using a package to do it, like Passport, is again, read their documentation, take that one line that they've made for you to be able to interact with Apple's API and add that into your code. Where if you're doing it manually, again, you would have to add in much more than that. There would be a lot more you would have to add. So it's that balance of like, if Google were to change their system, you would still have to go into your app if it was done in vanilla JS and change it. So there's not much of a difference. In fact, again, a package manager can be easier because if, if Google updates, updates their system and the package updates, all you would have to do is go in and npm in, install update or whatever, or npm update and the package name, and it would update it for you. And then no, you would have to change nothing in your code. So in terms of a ticking time bomb, like a lot of things, like depending on how complex your site is, absolutely, it's possible that you're creating a ticking time bomb that you might have to maintain for a long time. But on the other hand, um, using a package manager might make it easier for you to maintain it, especially if there's complex functionality. If we're talking a site that has pictures on it that you're just displaying, I don't think that that's a ticking time bomb. I don't think there's anything that you would use in there that would cause it to be a ticking time bomb. But but again, like like I said, using something like a login functionality, that could be. Because that's, that, that's remote. The point is, is that's, that's remote. That's remote. Yeah. So somebody like Apple could say, hey, you know, we're changing it every, everyone from passwords to pins. And then like your plugin for whatever reason, just making this up, but your plugin for whatever reason demands eight characters, whereas the pins are only four or something. And then now you've now you've had a problem because like that that's where things break is the is yes. the remote whereas yeah. old, that's why old programs on a disk assuming windows is still you know the same windows that you're using or is compatible the that program is is the program you know it doesn't rely on a remote service in general the older programs don't and that's why they continue to work until windows stops them from working right so it would be the same as it being like Hey, you know, it's been 10 years and I've been maintaining your site and, you know, the hosts are getting rid of PHP or whatever. Again, just making this up. So we really need to, you know, get you off of this. Like we like like we have to get you off of this now. So you either, you know, pay to move or, you know, that's it. I don't know what else to say, you know, and that's logical. Like uh, I was <laughs> it's kind of off topic, but it related. Um, I was like reading a Reddit that's uh I can't remember what it is. I can't remember the subreddit, but it's it's something where like uh, like it's choosing beggars. I think that's the subreddit where people try to get stuff for free for no reason. And it's kind of it's always just like pictures of conversations. And one of the conversations was um, a plumber that uh, that got a message from someone that they didn't know saying that uh, their shower is broken. They need to come and fix it. And the guy's like, well, I, like, I don't have you in my phone. I don't know who this is. Like, well, did I install the shower? And they're like, yes, you installed the shower for us. And it, it just it just stopped working all of a sudden. And like, what's going on? And it turned out that the plumber installed the shower 10 years ago. And this guy, this guy's shower stopped working after 10 years. And he thought that that was still within the time that it's, bec- it's the, it's the uh, plumber's fault. So the plumber had to go in through this entire expo- like go into this like deep dive explanation to him saying that like hey listen like it worked for 10 years you should be happy like most of these showers like that are rated that are cheap they're they're rated for like 6 5 6 years. Mm-hmm. So you got everything you could out of it. And that's kind of the approach that you would take with this. It's the same thing. And in the web you could argue like we're not a sh- we're not installing a physical shower like stuff moves way faster. Like the technology of plumbing moves a lot slower <laughs> than the technology of the web. So in turn, maybe it's something you have to build into your contract uh, to say that, hey, you know, in three years, we're not really responsible for the intricacies of your dependencies, essentially. Like if, if one of your features stops working, that could be a literal depreciation of the, the technology that it's been uh, that was used at the time so there's nothing we can do without a new contract or without like you know additional cost that's how i would handle it right that's a that's a good point like i think mm-hmm. i think there's there's like an intrinsic um like the shower head is a weird is a weird thing to think about but it's interesting that it, it kind of spills over in, mm-hmm. outside of tech whereas in tech you know tech is nowadays always available and always there and we don't really necessarily realize that it relies on so many things, but just like the shower, you know, it age, it ages, gets old and will eventually stop working. It's, it'd be the equivalent of me blaming the fact that, you know, we recently got a new furnace 
because the last person installed it and it just suddenly broke, you know, you don't, it, it, it's the, it's the, it's the thought that, you know, you don't see hundred year old furnaces anymore. And that's because they were all slowly broken or, you know, they were broken physically or they broke down or however they came to be. And then they were replaced either due to efficiency or due to them being broken. They were replaced. Like it's the whole car thing. You don't see model T's driving around anymore. You know, those type of things, you know, it's not like people are like, Hey, like Ford, what the hell, man? Like I bought this model T. If you do see a model T driving around it's because it's been like immaculately maintained or rebuilt. Rebuilt. It's the same thing. Like if you see a website from 10 years ago, that's around, it's because someone went in there and maintained it to some degree. And, and, and like, I I have a feeling that, you know, it's, the cutoff is strange. I think this is where, this is where the problem comes in. The cutoff is strange because, you know, Mike and I have been dealing with, and as I've already stated, like a lot of, or at least me personally, a lot of anxiety about maintaining stuff because I just think about it. Like, I'm like, man, if I wake up one day and like all our projects are, are down, like this is not good, you know? And, you know, we're not necessarily an on-call company. We're not necessarily available all the time and we just have so much to maintain. But realistically, you know, a bunch of that stuff really isn't our responsibility. Person hired us. They paid us once. They told us to put up a site. Oftentimes it's on their hosting and then you walk away more or less. And if something goes wrong, Mike and I are nice enough and whatever and we do not to pat ourselves on the back, but we do oftentimes fix it. But if it was something really major where it was going to take several days to fix, if there was some sort of complex problem, that really wouldn't be us. That would be the person that, you know, we would have to say, hey, man, we're going to need some compensation. We got to have a conversation about this. And we have told people we had to rip things out, um, like sites out completely and redo them. But it's just one of those things where. I guess because everything is so instant that I just don't know where the cutoff is, you know, and, and to be fair as a tech person, and maybe I'm alone in this, although I don't think I am, is I always get the, like the, the anxiety rush of like, holy crap, this thing is down or holy crap, this thing is out of order or whatever. Uh, or, oh my God, this person hasn't registered or, oh my God, this is happening. And then I kind of want to fix it right away, fix it right away. Like, let's get it done. Let's get it done. Cause tech is so instant where then, you know, you call the client and sure you're going to have clients that yell and everything else at you. But you're also going to have clients that are be like, oh, yeah, that's been down for like 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 four or five days. Like I just thought it would come back, but it didn't. And they're, and it's not their primary concern. And so it's just sort of like, a, I don't know, it's a tech guy's doom, if you will, where we don't – or personally anyway, I don't know when to cut off support. I don't know when to say, hey, that's it. You know, it's over. And there are clear-cut signs sometimes if something has aged out completely, like the shower or whatever, where it's like, dude, that thing is done. Like, I can't – or like, hey, I'm using WordPress 1.0. Um, Maybe don't do that, you know? Stuff like that is like a clear, like, dude, don't do not do that. <laughs> um, But I guess it's just it's just a matter of it being like people want everything instantly this day these days, and I'm not – I'm one of them, you know, the Netflix and everything else, and it's – it's hard to tell when to cut it off. It's hard to tell when it's no longer your responsibility. Yeah, absolutely. And and we'll get into it a little bit more in the web news, but I have I have some analogies and some some ways that I handle this. So we'll we'll talk about that and maybe it'll become a little bit more of a strategy session even between us mm-hmm. on how you handle it because if it's bothering you, obviously that's not good for our business in general. Um, but yeah, so with with that, uh, let's move on to segment number 2, uh, which is the package.json file. So this is what's generated when you create the packet, like when you create a new project with with an npm uh, command line tool, and this file package.json tells your project what packages and scripts your project is using, as well as a couple other things, and I'll get into them. Um, the dependency section is really important. That's probably the most important thing of the package file, uh, and it tells your project what dependencies are needed for your project to be operational. So all the packages that are involved with your project will be stored here. And this, incl- this I don't, okay, so one thing that I didn't check before I started, um, but I'm, yeah, it doesn't include every single dependency of your dependencies. That's something that I wanted to note. It doesn't include like, you know, the nested dependency stuff. That's kind of handled separately and that's handled within the dependencies package.json because each one of these uh, dependencies that you're going to be mentoring, like Vue.js or Vue Router or uh, Passport, they're going to have their own package.json file, which will list their dependencies. So it's kind of like a nested package file that your uh, NPM command line tool, when you're building or downloading stuff, 
is able to read and, and read into the nested stuff. So that's why you don't really have to worry about nested dependencies. That's why this package.json file is usually pretty clean. You're not seeing hundreds of packages. You're seeing like, you know, your five or seven or eight, however many you're using. Um, so one thing that I do want to note with, with, the, uh, with the packages is their version numbering. So it's really important to kind of understand it at least to some degree, because there's a few characters that are used that sometimes have confused me in the past and can kind of can really affect your project's stability. Like I said before, Yarn takes care of this stuff for you more or less, whereas with NPM, you have to know it a little bit better. So for instance, the little squiggly tilde key in front of a version will, will, tell, your, uh, will tell that package that it needs to be updated to the next minor revision. For example, if your package has a tilde 1.2.3, it will update only to 1.2.9. So it'll only do the patch updates and it'll never update past your secondary version number, right? So it'll never go get to like one point, it'll never get to 1.3 essentially if you have the tilde in front of it. This is done again for stability purposes because if, if this package works perfectly for your exact use case and you want it to remain in, in, in this version, but you want to make sure that whenever you do an install or an update, it at least ca catches some of the, the minor things that are fixed, like the security stuff. Usually the, uh, the last digit updates are meant for security or small breaking fixes for edge cases. You want to make sure that those are, are, are entranced in your updates. That's when you use the tilde key, right? For stability. There's also a upwards caret, like a little triangle. If that's in front of the version, it will update to the next major revision. So that means that it's one, one decimal point to the left. So for example, a version with a caret 1.2.3 will update all the way to 1.9.9. .9. It'll never update to 2.0, but it will take all the minor revisions all the way up to the major revision, the next major revision, but it will stop there. It'll never get to 2.0. So again, it's the same kind of thing. Now you're you're playing a little bit more loose, saying that like, oh, I I, I like the roadmap of this package. Um, I want to get, I want to see where it goes, and I want to be on on the ride for it. Maybe you're, it's not a production application at this point, so you don't really care about the instability, uh, and you, you're just kind of building it out, and you want to adapt. That's when you would use something like this, right? And then there's also a, a few other a few other ones. These are the ones that like are most confusing, right? So the tilde and the caret. And then there's also an asterisk, which will actually update to any of the major versions. So it will update to I think the newest one at first, and then it'll stay there. From what I understand, um, there's a latest keyword, so you can put like you know instead of putting a version number, you can just write latest as a string, and it will always keep it up to the very latest version. So regardless, you know, if it's 1.2.3 and the latest version is 2.4.7, it'll go right to 2.4.7, right? Um, then there's also a greater than or less than. This is done, again, to avoid compatibility issues. So if you know your package works uh, on, you know, version 1.2.3, but doesn't work on 1.2.4, but it'll work any, any version before that, then you'll do like anything less than 1.2.4, stuff like that. And greater than same kind of deal. So just a little up, just a little information about how these packages are numbered, how these little, uh, characters work. So it's important to kind of know what's going on because sometimes you can get into a big project and you can find stability issues. And this is something that you would look at to see if maybe you can, uh, alter these to be more stable and to make sure that your packages don't go you know out of whack because every time you update your project and you put it onto a server a lot of these continuous integration platforms like netlify or uh you know all, all like uh, github pages all those things that will run a script called npm install and npm run serve or npm run build and those will actually do uh, check your dependencies file here and update based on your indication. So based on that caret or based on the tilde key or based on whatever you write. Um, all right. So next here, let's just break down what, what's, what other things are in this package.json file. So there's a name. Um, this kind of stuff, like the name of the package file can be used for multiple things. I've personally used it to actually label my, uh, like, page title and use it as my like actual app name. So you can export any of this information out of your package file and put it into your app with view. It's, it's quite, it's quite simple. You just import it uh, with a regular import statement in your, in your project. And you literally then access it with a dot because it's just a JSON file. 
Again, it's package.json. It's just a bunch of information. You can use it however you want. It's a good place to keep your, uh, like the, the information of truth, right? So there's the same thing, version number. Uh, is is located in the package file. And that's, again, it's another one of those things that I use for my versioning number in my projects. I export it out there. There's a Boolean variable called private. So this is for if you want to create a public or a, a private package. So if you want to put something on the NPM store or on the NPM package manager for people to download and use, you would obviously set the private to false and then uh, follow all the other protocols that they have and you're, you're able to get it on the store. Um, there's also a script section. So the scripts is interesting. This is something that will allows you to set specific keywords for the npm run command. So if you're familiar with Vue, it's like when you write when you type in npm run serve, it actually runs whatever you put into the script called serve inside the scripts uh, object from package.json. So for instance, like Vue CLI service is something that is a command line tool for Vue, and it allows you it. It allows you to essentially not have to write view CLI service every time and go into a view command line. It, it'll do it for you. So all you have to do is write npm run serve and it'll run whatever you write on there. And you can put whatever you want, like command line commands in there. If you have like other stuff, like you need to uh, put a different mode or a different variable into your into your like command line command, like a, a mode is used a lot, a lot of times in environment variables for environment variables. So if you have a different uh, environment file for production or development, you would change the mode. And this is where you would do that in the scripts. Uh, there's also, let me just go down here. Um, so there's also different configurations for some of your packages. So for instance, ESLint, that's a package, that's a regular NPM package. It can actually be configured through your package.json file. So it has its own configuration in there. Uh, you know, you can set your environment, you can set what kind of ES linting profile to use, Airbnb, view, whatever. Uh, you can set your parsing options to Babel, all that stuff from your package.json file. So it actually has some configuration for your packages itself. Um, but other than that, that's about it for the package.json file. There's not much else. Uh, that you need to know about it, and I just want to that I just want to move on to segment number three, which is kind of the most important seg segment. Because if you've listened to it up to this point, you're like, oh my god, there's a lot of information here. But segment number three is what you actually need to know from all this. It's not actually important for you to know every single piece of this. I think for me, I was just, I just want to give a service out to people so that they can at least recall it or understand a little bit more. But it's not important for you to memorize it. There's nothing you need to really apply right away. Um, and again, even though there is quite a lot of information, it's important not to get overwhelmed. So NPM is something you can definitely progressively learn as you need it. It's not something you need to like, if you're looking to get into framework development, like Vue, Vue.js or uh, React, you don't have to first start by learning NPM ins and outs. That's not necessary. Your first run will probably be using one of those frameworks and what the like the beauty of those frameworks is they actually create a package.json file for you. You don't have to touch it. You don't have to create one. I've personally never created my own package.json file for my for a project. I've always used some sort of a CLI service that will, you know, download the dependencies that I need, put them into the package.json file and then create it for me and then I can just go in there and edit it as I want. So that's that's the good news. Um the only things that you need to kind of know right off the bat are how to add another package and how to use some of the command line commands. So for instance, to add a package, you need to know how to install it. And all it is, is in the command line of your, when you're, when you're in the directory of your project, you just have to write npm install and then the package name. And at the end of that, or before it, you can do a dash dash save modifier and that dash dash save modifier will actually add that package to your package.json file. And therefore it will be added to your Git. And if someone else were to pull your packet, pull your project, they'll be, when they run their initial npm install command, which we'll talk about in a second, it'll go through and install that package that you have added previously. Now, again, going to the npm install command, that's another one that you're probably going to be using on a regular basis. That's something that you would run whenever you either A, want to update your packages, or B, have just pulled a project from a repo. 
So it's a fresh project. The first thing that you want to do is you want to run an npm install. And what that'll do is it'll go into your package.json file, see what packages you need, install them all for you, get all your dependencies for those packages set up. It usually takes a little bit of time depending on your network connection and the speed of your computer uh, because it has to go in again to all those packages and install their dependencies as well. So other than that, like those little things, and again, I summarized them in, in a matter of like a minute or two, that's all you really need to know. Everything else you can learn progressively as you need it. So if you need to manipulate a script, uh, it's actually a pretty rare thing, especially if you're just learning. If you need to manipulate it, learn how to manipulate the script. If you need to, you know, pull in some version information or some name, learn how to do that. But it's not necessary for you to get started. It's not necessary for you to even get a production app ready. It's not necessary for you to know every little piece about a, a thing like a packet manager. But it is necessary for you to at least know that they exist, what they do, and how to use them. I got a question, actually. So this is more of just like a direct, straight up technical question. So you said, you know, you pull a new directory down or like a GitHub repo specifically. And uh, at that point, you run your NPM install, which makes sense to grab all the packages and such. Uh, what happens if, for example, you have an older repo? So you've worked on a project for a while. You're done your part. You leave the project, whatever the project goes on for years, months, whatever. You still have that local file, let's say, and then they say, hey, you know, we need you to work on it again. So obviously, you you know, you pull down the new stuff from Git, but then what do you do? Do you run an NPM install again or is there like an NPM update or something? You run an NPM install again. That's exactly you it. Just run it again. Okay. So, yep, that's it. So if you're working on a package again, you would pull from Git. And what happens when you pull from Git is it'll actually download the newest package.json file. Mm -hmm. So if someone was working on it and ran their NPM installs and added another package It'll be in that package.json file. So when you, you know, pull from the repo, you'll get the update. You'll run an npm install. It'll update all your packages to whatever you set, right? Again, if the package is set to a certain version number without any character in front of it, it'll stay at that version forever. So it won't update it. But if it's set to, like, you know, update to whatever or the latest, it'll always update to the latest. And that'll, that'll be what runs during the npm install. Okay. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Okay. So I think, I think that's it for, uh, package managers do you want to get into the web news yeah i mean uh i mean i think that was a good good conversation um and actually i do just want to ask not to sound like sound like a, or beat a dead horse or whatever they call that thing with webpack but what is the difference because i remember you were saying and this is like a serious technical question that's what i mean i'm not joking around <laughs> um so you said you were going to do a webpack episode but had to do this first so for the people that don't know including myself why is that like what's the you know the quick answer to what's the difference what you know what why did you have to do that so webpack really is is nothing to do it's not really related to packages right but it is something that takes it and makes it a little bit easier for you to bundle packages so it essentially can like it, it does the minification it does the uh checking to make sure that you're actually bundling packages that you're using in the code so it goes in and analyzes your code in that way. Um, it does some progress, like uh, some lazy loading techniques. So for instance, it, it'll put it so that if you're loading a page and it doesn't need a couple of the packages that you're using, it won't actually load those packages. So it kind of helps facilitate the, um, the serving of your website more so than the cre more so than the creation of it, if that makes sense. Now, there is more intricacies to Webpack that I haven't delved into myself, uh, and I do want to delve into them before I talk about them, but that's essentially the, the Coles notes or the quick, the quick, you know, explanation about why I wanted to get into packages first and then get into what helps manage those packages. Okay, cool. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, that, that's all I wanted to know was just basically, because I'm sure people were thinking like, well, isn't Webpack about packages? But clearly, you know, there's a difference there. So, okay. Yeah. Uh, I think that's important to know. So, uh, web news this week, uh, so sort of my web news, uh, sort of coming from my own sort of professional, my own w w weekly pain point, I guess. So There's just stuff going on all over the place and we're starting to get to a critical mass. Now, I've said this a bunch of times, but we've, we've hit critical mass in terms of like actually hit it now, um, of technologies and things to maintain and tickets coming in and all this. We've hit a point in which it's just like, it's starting to wane on me and it's starting to wane on me on time off. And it's starting to make me constantly check if things are up and like, it's I'm basically become an I, my own IT ban again. Um, and starting to go a little crazy. And 
some of the stuff just needs to be standardized. So basically what I mean by that is, you know, we need to standardize our own technology so that it's more quickly serviceable. You know, we have, you know, too many technologies. We we just straight up have too many technologies all over the place. And, you know, it makes it very difficult to task switch. So for, for example, if you, you're on WordPress uh, and I built a site for you and something goes horribly wrong and you call me and I'm working on couch CMS, it's like, you know, it's a totally different world, totally different setup. I'm all over the place. I don't remember whether you got a cPanel or you hosted with us, whatever. And that's not even the technical part of the task switch, right? So there's already like that sort of logistical task switch where you're like, what host are you on? Who are you again? Those type of things. And then also like, hey, like I got to switch from Couch CMS to WordPress. The whole different, the whole different thing. So we got Couch CMS, WordPress, Webflow, Vanilla, all over the place is my, my last point in this list. We got a bunch of stuff all over the place. We got some Typo three in there. We got we got, we got it's all over the place. We got people everywhere, uh, basically. And it's just one of those things where we need to start standardizing because we also, because we need to start, we need to make it so that if something goes wrong, we are able to service it quickly. So a prime example would be if you know that Google authentication, you know, let's say you use the Google authentication for for one of your customers' websites. So they, you know, their users log in with Google to get into their, your client's web app. And you know for whatever reason that Google authentication is down on their end. If your if your ear is to the you know ear is to the ground or whatever they call it, uh, using a lot of metaphors that I'm unfamiliar with today. <laughs> but if you're like you know listening for that and you see that, you know you're going to get a bunch of calls about that, and you know what your response is going to be, or you can even send out the alert if you have that sort of agreement with your clients. Whereas if I only used Google authentication on one project and I always use Apple on everything else and all of a sudden Google's down, I'm going to be freaking out, checking databases, looking all over the place, trying to figure out what's going on. Is it the host? Is it this? Is it that? And I'm not going to be familiar with what what exactly is happening. So that that's sort of one of the... That's sort of one of the things, right? And and we have like we've even had it a few weeks ago where somebody was saying, hey, my, you know, my, my webmail, my email is down. And I'm like, well... Like it shouldn't be like, you know, I don't really maintain that. And then I go and I look and there was like a huge, you know, data center outage. Now it was only total maybe luck or intuition or whatever that that's where that's the first place I checked. You know, I could have wasted time making myself an account under their domain, trying to send emails and like read the logs or like or whatever I need to do. I could have been messing around with that. But instead it was, you know, luckily something that wasn't really on our end necessarily. Host needed to fix it. They fixed it and that was it. But that's just one of those things, right? Where if my ear was to the ground there and I was constantly monitoring or like at least, you know, it was a thing I would check you know, it became the thing I would check, then I wouldn't be so all fired up. So this is kind of stemming from the fact that we have a really, I'm not going to get into details and like name names and stuff, but we have a really, really big project that just event just finally fired out. And it's a really like a, it's, it's such a big project that if something goes horrifically wrong, you know, I assume we're going to be contacted at any time. And I can't fix all the problems. I can only fix like half of them. And then like, that's the scary part is like, I didn't build half of it. You know, someone else built half of it and half the functionality. And it's also a matter of it being like, you know, it's none of us, like me, the other people that were involved in the project, none of us are technically on call, but I have this like constant anxiety in my head of being like, holy crap, this could go wrong at any time. So... Like, I'm trying to find ways to insulate myself from that, obviously, you know, backups, stuff like that. But it's still a matter of it being like, you know, I can't necessarily fix all the things that are in this. And even if I could, even if I was fully capable of fixing everything in there, I would be incapable of doing it quickly. Because I'm not using this particular piece of software every day. And that's really the scary part, I think. Well, it is the scary part. It's just straight up. So I don't know, Mike, you said you had some, you know, comments and some min- or whatever you had methodologies uh, to deal with this. So please, sir, enlighten yeah. me. <laughs> so, yeah, there's a few there's a few things, obviously, here. Um, but the, the main thing is, I think, for for that specific client is we need to get something on paper and something communicated out to them stating what we can and what we cannot do. 
right? We need to give them a very clear definition of our capabilities and also a clear definition of what the essentially a cost breakdown. And maybe for this client, it won't work that way. But for most clients, we need to associate their service with an actual cost. Right now, we do have some monthly cost like monthly subscribers to our service Mm -hmm. to essentially like support their websites but not everyone and a lot of the people that contact you matt and correct me if i'm wrong uh or uh, some people that contact you with all these like really obscure problems they're legitimately like have purchased a website from us one at one point and they're on their own hosting and everything like that so we don't have a maintenance contract with them and they're contacting you and it's kind of flipping you on the side and making you work on their on their stuff right away, even though we don't have any sort of service contract with them. And you're doing it like out of the kindness of your heart, as I like to say, or uh, like, you know, just y- you feel obligated to help them. Uh, but I think that's what we need to kind of shift away from. Yes, sometimes if it's a simple, you know, hey, does Google work on Microsoft question, like a really stupid question like that, like we, we've been asked stupid stuff before and you can answer it in one second, then answer it. Yeah, of course. But if it's something that requires you to go in there and actually like troubleshoot something or requires you to switch tasks uh, and go away from your actual paid work, then it doesn't make sense for you to invest your time into that without setting up some sort of a service contract. Like it's unfortunate for the customer that paid us two years ago. But that's just how it works. It's the same thing with the plumbing example that I had. Like you didn't fix a shower yesterday. You fixed a shower three years ago. Like you're no longer obligated to help them right away. If you want to be a nice guy, then what you would do is you would see that email and be like, okay, there's an email from a customer that's not paying us. Put it to the side. When you have a second and you're relaxed, maybe look at it then Mm. and see if you can answer it. You know what I mean? Like, so we have to, we have to set up these clear bounds for you and for myself to make sure that we don't get overwhelmed with stuff that doesn't make sense for us to get overwhelmed with. And then obviously, like I said before, we have to set up clear guidelines for the customers to be able to contact us. So like you said, we're not on call. We don't have a contract for any sort of on-call support. If they call you and you're not available at 8 p.m. in the evening, we don't have a contract with them for you to pick it up. Don't pick it up. Put it. Send it to voicemail. Deal with it the next day. Mm-hmm. And yes, that alone can cause some anxiety for, for me as well. Like whenever I get a call about work at 8 p.m., I don't really like that because like it throws off whatever I was doing. But that's that's kind of the challenge to ourselves to be able to move that over to the work day. Yeah. That's why like for me personally, and I know this doesn't work for you, but for me personally, setting myself up to work certain hours to a certain degree during the day has helped me because now outside of those hours, I'm not, I don't feel obligated. You know what I mean? Like, yes, people contact me. Yes. I sometimes answer during those times, but at least I don't feel obligated. I don't feel the panic of like, Oh, I should be checking my phone all the time for, for an email. Maybe something went down. Like I, it, it doesn't like it, it, it helps me because I know I've put in my like seven or eight hours already into helping them maintain their systems. And all that time outside of it, I can do whatever I want. If something comes up, it comes up. They're going to have to wait. That's that's the that's the methodology. That's the thing that you have to get to is like, it's okay if they wait. Again, none of our contracts, not one, has us having to suppl- support in any amount of time. It could be two days. If, they're, if their business is down two days, it's their, their problem. We don't have – like we're not getting paid enough to be able to – to do that kind of stuff, to be a 24 hour support team. If we want to set that up, like let's say this new project that you're talking about that was just launched recently, if they want us to be on call support, which they haven't indicated that they do, I'm just saying a, a big if, then that's something that we would have to discuss with them on a like monetary basis. Like there have to be some sort of payback for us because again, it's not just us responding to their calls. It's us being worried all the time that they might call. It's occupying you're mind space. Doing that. Yeah, it's occupying yeah, you're mind You're already space. doing that, even though we don't have a contract with them, right? So it's – and it, it in the end, it's really up to us to determine that. If we don't want to do 24-hour support, they can say that they want 24-hour 24, 24 support all they want. We only offer support during work hours. 
I suppose, it really is up to us. I suppose it is like I'm I'm worrying more so like being like, oh my god, as the user, like if I stop working at four PM or something, I don't know, stop working at four PM and the, the thing goes down at four oh one, I'm like, holy crap, like now that site's been down for like a day and a half. I'm like, what's gonna happen? You know, and then I'm like worried, worried, worried. And like the holiday season's coming up and now I'm gonna be like, Holy crap, like if I go out for like you know, for the holiday season, for whatever reason, like if I'm going literally out like on Christmas or like on New Year's or if I'm like doing a weekend away during the holiday season or something, now I'm going to be worried all the time. Like, oh my God, I'm going to be gone for two, three, four days. And like, now what if that site went down on day one? I better check, I better check, I better check, I better check. You know? Again, that kind of stuff, like that's where we need to have some sort of redundancy between us or between our contractor. So that if you were to go out for four days and there was an emergency, someone else can take over for you. Mm-hmm. So that's that's on us to to get that. And again, that's something that we have to offer as a service to our client. It's not something that we just they just get for free. Mm-hmm. That ab- like you being able to like being able to support their stuff on a daily basis is absolutely a service that we should be getting paid for. And because we're getting paid for it, it'll be a lot easier for us to be motivated to figure out a redundancy system. So when you go on. When you go on your vacation, stuff will go to me, right? If there's something I can solve, there's something I can solve. If there's something I can that's not major, I can communicate to them that, hey, we're looking into it. You know what I mean? Like I'll handle the communication and I'll be the one that escalates to you, right? So th- therefore, you don't have to worry about the customer mm-hmm. management. And that's I think that's the way we'd have to handle it. That's something that's, again, on us. Um one one of the analogies or like uh, that that I wanted to bring up to this was like a real life thing that happened a while ago a little while ago now maybe like 6 months or 7 months ago um one of our first projects that we did uh they contacted me again i'm not going to name them or anything like that but they contacted me again they're like hey we're looking to redo the site again and this like we we did their site it was one of our first site one of the first sites we ever built so it was like what 4 years ago Something like something. that, yeah. Something like yeah, that. Yeah, like we, it was a basic site with just like a bunch of content, a bunch of data, um, nothing, no, no complex functionalities. And they wanted to put some complex functionality, like a member, a members only area with a bunch of encryption, a bunch of information, so that the members can log in and get information back for for their whatever they were doing. Um, they wanted a lot of functionality, and realistically, I I just told them like the the realistic outcome of this is most likely we're not gonna be able to take this project on right even though it's like great like we, we had a good working relationship with them at the start but it's okay to say no sometimes you're not obligated to support the pro- project that you did four years ago that you're not obligated to be a dick about it like you're not going to say like no fuck no i'm not going to do your yeah, project yeah, don't be unprofessional not. in any case yeah be professional and it ended up working out because i actually suggested someone they went with them and everything kind of worked out but regardless um it's okay to say no as well that's the thing like when someone calls you one of our old clients that's on a technology that you're not aware of and you a you've picked up the phone and you've listened to their thing sometimes it's okay for you to be like hey i don't know that um i could probably figure it out but we'd have to figure out a a contract or i don't know that and currently i just don't have enough bandwidth to uh to be able to tackle that, maybe give me a call back in a few months or like in a month and we can discuss it again. Something like that. Usually that'll stem them away. Yeah, I suppose like we do this a similar thing where if somebody asks for something that is going to require a lot of infrastructure, then they like will like we'll just tell them the truth. Like, OK, like, you know, you, you'll probably be buying it through us. This is my cost associated with it. Like recently we had one where it was like my cost associated with this and this isn't even my my price, you know, this is my cost is 500 us a month. And to a Canadian customer, you know, that's a significant bump on top of the 500 because we're talking Canadian dollars, but then you're also talking like that person is already like, damn, you know, like if the per month expense for this guy is 500, then, you know, what the heck am I doing? I know a lot of people like to hide their expenses, but when it comes to something like that, you know, we already kind of we bump people by letting them bump themselves. Like we'll be like, yep, we looked into this. This is going to be 500 a month US and I'm going to have to charge, you know, like a, a service fee on top of this or maybe I'll just charge at cost because it's a part of the hosting or whatever, you know, the the situation brews. That's we, like we're we're comfortable with that. And I think maybe what we need to start doing is we start needing need to start being comfortable or at least myself. I need to be start being comfortable with saying the same thing with my time, like saying 
this is going to take like 30 hours. You know, I'm not like, you know, that this is a, like, I've had to bring this out a couple of times, like forced to is like, you know, you went to a three man operation. So, you know, like effectively, you know, so two, three man operation, you know, that you're not going to someone like Microsoft, which is like a mega corporation. You know that that's, that's the case. Cause we've had people come to us and say, we want zero downtime. We'd be like, not possible. And they'll be like, well, it has to be I'm like, okay, like, thank you for calling, you know, digital dynasty design. And like, you know, I'm not trying to be a dick and I'm like, more, you know, a little more professional than that on the phone, but it does come down to people that they will expect everything for the nominal price just because they're like, oh, you're a smaller operation. So you're cheaper, right? It's like, yeah, but you also understand that it's only three people, you know? So, and then they'll be like, well, if your technology, I've heard this one a few times too. If your technology works, like if the code that you like write works, then it wouldn't have a problem when you're gone, right? Like, and if it does, then like, clearly you don't know what you're doing. And we do have standoffish clients like that. And we stand off against them. Now, the reason why I even bring this into this conversation is that we don't need to be a dick to other clients. Like, that's not what we're trying to say, but we do, what we maybe should do is apply a similar principle in that, like, they clearly have a stance, you know, that those, those people that are very demanding and we've all experienced them, especially if you've been in the industry for a while, they have a stance. Now I'm not saying be like them. Maybe we should take a, a note from their, their book, if you will, and say, okay, this is our stance. You know, we only do support like this. We only do hours like this. I only answer the phone like this. And, you know, sometimes maybe I will answer the phone like later or whatever. Like, you know, we're flexible in that way. But at the same time, it's sort of like you can't expect me there all the time. And you can't expect perfection. And you have to acknowledge that, yes, this is a two to three man operation. And that's what you're getting. You know, that's that's effectively what you're getting. You're not getting a mega corporation with a support team that has a call center and, 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 right? And we have, to be fair, we've seen this from larger web development companies where we'll, like, obviously, like, sometimes we'll approach them and we're the ones taking their job. So, <laughs> obviously, they're a bit standoffish. But we've had times where we've had to work with them. Just, just work with them, right? Like they built website one for clients and we're building website two for clients. So whatever, we're all being employed. It's fine. And we're just working together and they'll be very standoffish. Like, oh, we, we, we do calls at this time. We'll be do, we do this at this time. They have to, re- they have to use our software to contact us. They only can contact us for this. This is how much we charge a month. We don't do any maintenance for that price. We, you know, we will only do uh, like server maintenance, like stuff that's in the background, like not maintenance. Like, Hey, can you change my picture? stuff like that, like they don't care. And they, like, that's how the larger companies do it. Now, whether that's a thing because they're larger, like whether that's, whether that mentality came from them being large or that mentality resulted in them being large, if that makes sense, um, is a, it remains to be seen. And, you know, everyone's different and every company's run a little differently, but there, it does seem to come with the territory of being large anyway, whether that's the thing that got them there or not, is that, you know, you just have to logistically be like, and and we're hitting, like, we are legitimately getting to this point where we're just getting to the point where it's like, before it was just sort of like, call your, like, it's just like our introduction says, call your buddy for help. That's pretty much how we were treating our customers within reason, like charging them and stuff, uh, of course. But it was still like, you know, they could just sort of call us or text us, which they still can do. I'm not saying they can't, but we do need to do sort of set some boundaries where if someone's saying like, I need this by Wednesday, I'll be like, I'm not doing that by Wednesday. Like, what are you talking about? You can't tell me I'm going to do it by Wednesday. You know, that, that's not in the agreement anywhere. You know, I said within 30 days or I said within 10 days or I said nine, nine to five or whatever agreement we come up to them with or come up with them and they sign it or however that works, verbal or whatever we do. I think we need to be a little firmer on that. And to be fair as well, like Mike and I have been discussing getting separate phones for work and Mike's not going to, but I'm, I'm probably going to, I am going to, um, and like, uh, whatever. And we need a test iPhone anyway. So it's just killing two birds with one stone basically. But I have noticed that like I went into Outlook recently and I just, I just shut off my email notifications on weekends. Like it's just, it's an automated, automated thing. I could just say like, don't, don't send me notifications from these two accounts on weekends. And it has helped me like a lot last couple weekends. Cause I find myself, it's very strange. I find myself and I think it is due to the overflow. I find myself like if it's a day where I, you know, like you have a weekend day, but like sometimes it's not like a quote unquote day off. So you're like, you know, you're going, doing something, even though it's leisurely, you're still like doing something. You're going to the beach, you're going to the whatever you're going on a road trip, you're doing whatever. But then there's those other days where you're just sitting you know, sitting around, watching TV, watching movies, whatever. And 
on those days, I like find myself like anxious as hell and like freaking out a little bit because I'm like, what if that phone rings? What if that phone rings? Because there's nothing distracting me from the separation. But if I have a separation where if I were to pick up the phone and be like, sorry, man, I'll have to look at this on Monday. And the thing is that the weirdest part is like, like you're saying, like we're being nice in that. And like, there is a component to that, not to pat us on the back, but there is a component of that where we do want to be nice to our clients. Of course. So you're not, you know, not saying to be a jerk to them in any means, but if we call them, so we've, we have clients that we've literally bought stuff from because they have a useful service or whatever, right? So it's like, hey, build us a site for our e-commerce business, and then I want to buy something from them. If I went to them and I had a problem buying something, they would just say, oh, I'll be fixed in a couple of days. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't like yell at them or get pissed off. You know what I mean? I wouldn't be, even though I'm a customer of theirs at that point, I wouldn't be pissed off. But yet I feel weird pushing somebody off and being like, no, sorry, bud. So yeah. I, it's it's just I think that it just needs to be. I think it, the, it, I think I, we just need to be a bit more. Not mean, but strict, maybe. Yeah, structured, organized, um, stuff like that. Like we just we we need to have boundaries. We need to remove the obligation, right? Like we need to get it so that, uh, like you were saying, you know, if you get a call in the evening. And you look at it and you're like, oh, I feel obligated to answer this, even though it's, you're off hours. Don't answer it. But if you're, you know, if you're having a relaxing time and you don't mind answering, then answer it in in your off times. Yeah, yeah. Right? So we need to get to that point where we can psychologically, you know, remove ourselves from that. And I've been, I've been really, I've been getting better at it. Um, a few times I, I like, I've just not answered the phone because I just had a stressful day and I don't want to deal with it. You know what I mean? Like I, I had my day, I work my hours. I, I'm not going to do any more than that. Yeah, yeah. On that day, on some days, I work my hours. I have a good day, and someone calls me, and I'll answer it because I, you know, it doesn't affect me that much. So I've learned to separate it a little bit out. Uh, it's still there though. Like the the stress of it is sometimes still there when I'm on vacation. Like you said, I still have like that thing in the back of my head. Like, oh, what if something goes wrong, and then I'll have to, you know, hurry back or whatever. I don't know if that's going to go away. Like, I don't know if, like, realistically, we can move that completely away. We can mitigate it. We can make it better. But I don't think, like, because of the business that we're in, because we have our own business, because it's just it's just the nature of the beast. Like, I think we're always going to be on that a little bit on, on edge when we're away. Like, I, I don't think we can get away from it. But we can definitely mitigate it. We can make it better and we can personally handle it better. I think the best way to handle it would be, and like this is through standardization to bring it back to the, the topic, would be we start standardizing things. We start documenting things, which we do, you know, do amongst ourselves. You have Git repos and stuff, you know, whatever, like the normal sort of documenting and sort of coding term, if you will. And literal documentation as well. Sometimes we have help centers for clients and stuff um, that we've written up, but and, and for their clients as well. But. I think one of the things we need to do maybe is we need to look at, you know, if we could make everything open. So we make it so that, you know how like right now there's some stuff that only you can maintain and some stuff that only I can maintain. But like, let's just say we brought in like, I don't know, I'm just making this up. We brought in like uh, someone that could, someone or like a, a call center. If we had, if we could magically have a call center, right? Let's just say magically have a call center of people. They all know about our projects. They know how to maintain them, whatever we like to me anyway i'm just not gonna care at that point i'm just gonna be like oh like i gave them all the stuff like bye and then that's it yes and maybe we need to look at not a call center but we need to look at getting into a situation where you we can just we can afford something we like can that. just when well, not even but it doesn't even need to be a call center it could just be a person even if they're working nine yeah. to five it could just be a point where it's like well you know call the uh on like call the call the our secondary or like whatever we call them mm-hmm. to clients right our support team or whatever yeah. like some sort of catchy name that they'll use and you know yeah and and the, the way to get to that point the way to get to a point where we, we have a person that can help us is to have a monetary value for our time like that i think that's something that we're still weak on like we're getting better at but we need to set a standard for how our support works so if it's you know if they start calling us we need to bring up money right away be like hey you know this is 60 dollars an hour off time. Or this is our off time if it's an emergency no problem let's organize let's let's get a contract going um or l- l- let me send you over a quote right a- right away instead of instead of like you know taking in their information like taking in all the stuff that they're telling you to fix and then just fixing it we need to establish some sort of a process that 
doesn't stop them from doing it because, you know, if they have problems, they should contact us, but it should make them think twice when it's like a trivial problem, like changing the, you know, the header to a different color and they call you at 8 p.m. to change the header to a different color. That's something we have to stop. We have to stop that. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. That's not something that's, that's not acceptable in any way. That's something that we have to be very clear about. Um, But stuff like, hey, my, you know, my website is broken or something like that or a, a, a part of my website is broken and it's 8 p.m. and I need you to fix it. Um, I mean, we don't have a 24-hour contract with you. Here's how much it's going to cost. Yeah. No, yeah. Like we need to put it. Yeah, we need to put a monetary value to that kind of stuff. So I don't know. I don't know if there's anything else you want to add. I know we're kind of running up against the uh, the time limit that you have here. Oh, yeah, so. yeah. I'm taking off here. But uh, I mean, yeah. I took a couple minutes. But no, I, I honestly, I think that's a good conclusion to be honest, uh, I think I think this is sort of like the like exactly what we made web news for is there's just sometimes where you have to just sort of like state a problem and, you know, just literally discuss even live like this, you know, the the solution. And, you know, I'm sure we'll have more conversations internally as well. But it's just one of those things where that, that this is sort of what the web news is all, is all about is just sort of chatting, whether it's about news or something we're excited about or gaming or whatever, or literally something where it's not news, but it might be news to somebody. You know, there might be someone else that's listening to this right now that's at our scale of company in which they're experiencing the exact same problem and they're they're experiencing the exact anxieties of being like, holy crap, if this goes down, like we're in trouble, right? And, you know, there's ways to mitigate that. What one way is to you know get a good reseller that has good support and those type of things or or get it like like you resell it like you're the reseller but like the the hosting company that you're reselling from is the you know has good support stuff like that you know is a good way to to start but then you're worried about your own like sort of application part you know your web app your website your whatever your so yeah absolutely um I think that that really concludes the show unless you have anything else to add Mike. No, roll up the conclusion. Alrighty, well, uh, remember we're on, we are on that Patreon. That's patreon.com slash HTML, all the things. So check out those tiers and give that a go. And many thanks to our $3 tier patrons, Sean from RabbitWorks JavaScript via youtube.com slash RabbitWorks JavaScript, Garrick from Local Path Computing and Web Design via localpathcomputing.com, Ryan Gatchel from Blue Black Digital via blueblackdigital.com, uh, Chris from Self Made Web Designer via selfmadewebdesigner.com, Tim from The Web Hacker via thewebhacker.com, and D- or sorry, DL Ford from DL Ford.io and Bib Hashdash from Twitter via at Bib Hashdash. Feel free to leave a comment or a review on the platform that you are listening to this on. I'm going to let this outro sign us off. You've been listening to HTML All the Things Podcast. Web development, web design, and small business. We hope you've gotten some useful and practical information from this show. And we hope you appreciate that we talk to you like human beings. And we hope you had some fun. We'll be back soon. But in the meantime, hit us up on social media. On Facebook, Instagram, and Patreon at HTML All The Things. And on Twitter at HTML Everything. Until next time, this is HTML All The Things. Signing off.